York when we're uh, very grateful to have Zoom. Uh, I'm Leslie Stein. I'm the director of the Government Law Center at Albany Law School, and I would like to welcome you to the first program of the 2023 Warren M. Anderson series. I would also like to thank our series sponsors, Greenberg Traurig and family members, George Charles and Joan Weissman, in memory of Sharon P. O'Connor, Albany Law School class of 1979. And um, Briefly, the mission of the Government Law Center is to help state and local governments better serve their communities through nonpartisan legal research and analysis by bringing together a diverse and inclusive group of lawyers, students, scholars, and community partners. We prepare students for careers as skilled and leading attorneys in public service, advance Albany Law School's unique connection to government, and inform nationwide conversations on government and the law. We have a most distinguished panel of speakers today on the important and timely topic of the Lieutenant Governor, filling vacancies and assuring that government works. Our moderator will be Bennett Liebman, government lawyer in residence with the Government Law Center, who has extensive experience in government law, including serving as counsel for former Governor Mario Cuomo when he was Lieutenant Governor, Special Deputy Counsel to Cuomo when he was elected Governor, and Deputy Secretary to the Governor for Gaming and Racing. He's a renowned expert in racing and wagering law, and the Government Law Center is very fortunate to have him on its staff, including as interim director for almost a decade. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that a code word will be announced during the program, which will be necessary in order to obtain CLE credit. And with that, I will turn the program over to Bennett, who will introduce our distinguished panelists. Thank you, Judge Stein, uh, and thank you all for attending our first Warren Anderson Breakfast of the Year. This is the Government Law Center's 31st year, and we are glad that you're a part of what has become one of the oldest established public affairs programs in, in Albany. And thanks to Zoom, we don't even need an establishment anymore. I'm moderating this panel not just because I serve as the government lawyer in residence at the Government Law Center, but also because I'm the oldest established extant counsel to the Lieutenant Governor, having served in the early 30s when Mario Cuomo was Lieutenant Governor. I'm also here to provide you with the proper code that will enable you to get CLE credit to that. Uh, when I was counseled to Mario Cuomo, Warren Anderson was the Senate Majority Leader. Uh, in order for Senator Anderson to get from his office to the Senate chamber, he had to pass right by the Lieutenant Governor's office. One of the office doors was often open and Senator Anderson would walk by and look at us, clowning around, occasionally playing Nerf basketball, and he'd just roll his eyes and look exasperated, apparently wondering why he had to deal with us amateurs. In 1983, after Mario Cuomo became governor, Senator Anderson altered the passageway to the Senate so that he did not have to pass by the Lieutenant Governor's office on his way to the chamber. In his recent autobiography, gubernatorial speechwriter Peter Quinn stated that, quote, under the best of circumstances, the office of a lieutenant governor requires the skill set of a mannequin, unquote. Belying that observation is the quality <clears throat> of our panel today. We have Patrick Woods, not only one of my bosses as the deputy director of the Government Law Center, but also a former assistant solicitor general in the AG's office and a distinguished scholar and author in his own right. He's the author of a 2013 article in the Albany Law Review on gubernatorial succession, which is part of your materials here today. We have retired Justice Helen Friedman, who is a key part of the State Bar Association's recent recommendations on the office of the Lieutenant Governor. Now serving as a neutral for the Mediation and Arbitration Service jams, Justice Friedman was on the New York State bench for 36 years. She was an associate Justice of the Appellate Division, First Department, for six years and served for over eight years as a justice in the Commercial Division. If you're talking presiding over complex lit litigation, you're talking Helen Friedman. 
finally, we are most fortunate to have former governor and Lieutenant Governor David Patterson joining us this afternoon to provide us with a unique personal perspective on the Lieutenant Governor's office. We have no mannequins on this panel. Mario Cuomo often chafed at his position as Lieutenant Governor. He had little power and anything he said would have been viewed through the lens of how it might contrast with the governor's positions. Nevertheless, he would always say that no position ever provided a better perspective or view on all things Albany. And nobody, nobody has ever had a better perspective on this office than Governor Patterson with his 21 years in the Senate, including his service as the Senate Minority Leader, and Lieutenant Governor and Governor. We are most honored to have him with us this afternoon, and the floor is yours, Governor Patterson. Well, thank you. It's uh, <clears throat> a pleasure to be here. And what I can tell you is when I was elected Lieutenant Governor, which I wasn't elected separate from the governor, but when I was on the ticket, I learned that there was a new, there was an organization, I didn't know this was even possible, called the National Lieutenant Governors Association. And they would meet, uh, they met in Washington, D.C. that year. And um, I just wondered what an organization of Lieutenant Governors would actually talk about. And what uh, happened was that the first and only meeting that I attended at the National Lieutenant Governors Association, there was a discussion about being prepared to serve just in case uh, there was an occasion where the governor could not serve anymore. And they brought in, and I'm not thinking of his name right now, but uh, the governor of that particular state became a secretary in the Bush administration. And this gentleman became the governor for a while and I think he actually went back to lieutenant governor at some point. I'm just not remembering the names. But he was saying, you know, every two or three years, a governor leaves and there's a need to fill that position with a lieutenant governor. And I never really thought of it that way. But I think, um, I'm just trying, I think he was for, uh, represented Idaho. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe that's what goes on in these other states, but in New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, Florida, California, Texas, this isn't going to happen. Well, it did happen. And the next lieutenant governor to ascend to the executive branch was myself. And I had already agreed to allow the next meeting of the National Lieutenant Governors Association to be in New York. And of course, they all came there. And now I come there, but I'm now the governor. And I, uh, expressed to all of them that we had some special services for them that had never been uh, used before. One was uh, how to put uh, sugar in the car engine of the governor. Um, another was how to perform the fake Heimlich maneuver. In other words, the governor falls over in a restaurant, you go over and pretend to be administering, and then it doesn't work out. It's very sad, but now you're the governor. But in all seriousness, um, the issue of the lieutenant governor's office and how it presented itself was uh, came up in my administration because after I succeeded Governor Spitzer, the thought never even crossed my mind to uh, try to appoint a lieutenant governor. But in June, in fact, June 8th of 2009, there was a coup in the New York State Senate when two members of the Democratic Party went and sat with the Republicans, changing the majority from 32 Democrats to 30 Republicans to now 32 Republicans to 30 Democrats. One of the two senators uh, who uh, switched, then switched back a couple of days later, kind of like the ball bouncing back and forth at Wimbledon. And now you had 31 Democrats, 31 Republicans, they couldn't hold a session because they really could not determine which party was in charge. Uh, we had the budget all ready to go. We had some legislation that we wanted to pass that there was no opposition in either house. 
involving aid to local governments, we couldn't do it because they wouldn't agree on how they could go in, even though they would have voted 62 to nothing unanimously to pass the legislation. This goes on for three weeks and all of it is being blamed on me, who, as I remembered, was no longer a member of the New York State Senate. So in trying to figure out how to address this issue, um, we, uh, my council, con uh, consulting with councils from previous uh, executives at, in the state, thought that we could appoint a lieutenant governor. Now, it wasn't particularly clear in the Constitution whether or not you could do that, except that in 1942, an attorney general was elected in the state died between the time he was elected and was about to take office and having uh, not be clear there was uh, a uh, actually the uh, court of appeals ruled that the governor should appoint a, a new attorney general so based on this um, dicta and the circumstances of this case uh, which now was in 1943 and was, uh, you know, a, a, a full 64 years earlier, we uh, decided that we could appoint a lieutenant governor. Now, one of the uh, issues that existed as well is if the lieutenant governor was appointed, could the lieutenant governor break the tie at 31 votes uh, on each side? That issue, as far as I remember, was never really resolved. But the Court of Appeals did upheld my ability to appoint the lieutenant governor. And at that point, I think the um, senators realized that uh, they would just return the uh, ma majority of the Democrats. And I believe the other member who had, uh, had uh, switched over to the Republican side came back to the Democratic side, they changed the majority leader, and that was the compromise that they reached. But the issue of the uh, value of the lieutenant governor was very important at that particular time, because had I, as governor, without a lieutenant governor, become incapacitated or forced to resign, <clears throat> um, at that point, the majority leader of the Senate was next in line. But the majority leader of the Senate would not be considered governor. He or she would be considered acting governor until such time as the issue uh, could, could be addressed. And that was one of the reasons why it's very important to have a lieutenant governor, because even if a lieutenant governor is just occupying a space, they were on the ticket that was elected and would inevitably be constitutionally fully enshrouded with all of the duties, powers, and authority uh, that the governor possesses. So that was something that we weren't thinking about really up until the crisis hit in June. Uh, it was actually on June 8th, 2009, and we didn't address it until that particular time. So I'll be very interested to hear what uh, ideas uh, people have. One idea that, um, I did read about that I just want to advocate wouldn't be a particularly good idea is that the appointing lieutenant governor would be approved by the Senate uh, 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 or, or confirmed by both houses of the legislature. I would suggest to all of you that just the activities that have gone on over the past uh, two or three months in Albany uh, really, uh, I think, make it clear that in that particular situation, you don't want to politicize it any more than it already is being who the governor selected to become the lieutenant governor. Uh, as you know, the legislature wrote a letter to the governor uh, just two months ago telling her specifically that she appointed certain individuals to the Court of Appeals that they would vote them down. Now, I think that that was an attempt by the legislature to usurp the, usurp the powers of the appointing uh, body, which was the commission that was going to bring before the governor seven candidates from which she would choose one to become uh, the next 
chief judge of, of the Court of Appeals. In that particular situation, the legislature inserted itself and then eventually not only voted down the governor's candidate, but voted the governor's candidate down in committee and then tried to prevent uh, a, a court from reviewing it by then uh, convening and voting, uh, voting the candidate down by the whole body. One of the reasons I think that it's important for um, Lieutenant Governor uh, uh, rising to a governor is the same as the vice president uh, rising to become the president if an event we have uh, a, a problem as we have had a couple of times where uh, Vice President Ford succeeded Richard Nixon and uh, then appointed the former governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller, in uh, uh, late uh, 1974 to become the vice president. I think that the, the way the federal government does it is the right way, and I would not involve the legislature in that kind of decision. But I'd be very interested to hear how all of you feel about uh, uh, these experiences and the role of the lieutenant governor. Thank you, Governor Patterson. Uh, at this time, I'll announce the, the code to be used. It's vacancy, V-A-C-A-N-C-Y. Vacancy is the, is the code that you should, that you should, that you need to use today in order for, for you to claim CLE credit. Again, vacancy. Now, uh, I'd like to hear for, uh, from, from uh, from Justice Friedman, who's really been part of the State Bar Association's committee on the New York State Constitution, which had which had last month had its recommendations approved by the full State Bar, um, have an interest <laughs> they have an interesting proposal, which is different to, from what Governor Patterson just recommended on. On on uh, on filling the vacancy. So, uh, Justice Friedman. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Liebman, and thank you very much, Judge Stein, and for inviting me to speak. Um, as you heard, the NISVA or the New York State Bar Association Committee on the Constitution decided to address this issue on the topic of the vacancy of the office of Lieutenant Governor or possibly gubernatorial succession. And a subcommittee was formed. Alan Rothstein was the chair. He did a wonderful job in keeping, uh, herding the cats and keeping us together and producing, he did, I said, had the laboring oar in producing this report, which again was adopted by the House of Delegates just this past January, January 2023. It has happened, as I understand, <clears throat> 12 times in New York State history that the Lieutenant Governor's position was vacant. In all that I understand for, nothing was done and the state survived. The, under the state constitution, the temporary president of the Senate or I guess pro tem, uh, Senate pro tem president fills the, fulfills the functions of the Lieutenant Governor, which in most cases involves breaking procedural rule ties, but has other functions as well, particularly stepping in for the governor. Um, beyond succession, we looked at a couple of other things, and that is the provision in the New York State Constitution that the lieutenant governor becomes governor anytime the governor is out of the state. And also what happens in the event that the governor becomes disabled or unable to perform gubernatorial 
functions. Um, in that sense, we followed the federal government amendment 25. Um, and we decided to look at the whole thing. First, we let me just, before I say what we did, I'll say that we had the benefit of the Law Review Commission report of 1986 on gubernatorial and Lieutenant gubernatorial selection. The report of the Fordham University Rule of Law Clinic and Patrick Woods's excellent Albany Review article of 2013. We also had the wisdom of other states that had dealt with the issue. And of course, the 25th Amendment to the United States Constitution. In 1847 and 1944, special elections were held when the Lieutenant Governor position was vacant or became available. But after that, an amendment to the state constitution prohibited the Lieutenant Governor from running for a special election, except if he or she were running together with the governor. And we approve of that because we want the governor and lieutenant governor to run together. They should be on the same wavelength, although it doesn't always happen, even if they're of the same party. Um, you've heard what happened in 2009 when Governor Patterson uh, took office and for 16 months or so, 15 or 16 months, there was no lieutenant governor. There didn't seem to be a problem. And then suddenly there was a big problem and lieutenant governor position needed to be filled. And there was no clear provision in the state constitution or by law. The governor then looked at the public officers law 43 which said and decided as he did that he could fill the position. Um, Senator Skelos challenged that decision and by a four to three majority, the Court of Appeals upheld Governor Patterson's decision and Richard Ravitch became the Lieutenant Governor. Based on that court decision, when Governor Hochul ascended to the bench, not the bench, I'm sorry, ascended to the governorship, she decided she could appoint a lieutenant governor to fill the vacancy that occurred, even though there didn't seem to be the urgency that had occurred when Governor Patterson did it. She first appointed Brian Benjamin Unfortunately, oh. Senator Benjamin was then indicted and had to step down. Um, and then she appointed Antonio Delgado, who was congressman from uh, the, I would say the Hudson Valley and moving west. Um, later that year or both the governor and lieutenant governor won primaries and they were able to run as a ticket. But for over a year and a half, we had an unelected lieutenant governor and we had the risk, of course, that either Delgado or Hochul could have lost the democratic primaries and each would have won, run with somebody else. But that's something that we did not address in our report, but we were aware of that as a potential problem. Um, as you know, Article 4, Section 5 of the New York State Constitution provides that in the case of impeachment, absence from the state or inability, the Lieutenant Governor should act as governor until the inability ceases or the term expires. Absence from the state is mentioned three times in Article 6. 
we thought that this was ridiculous, a ridiculous position, provision in this day and age. In the era of instant communication, the governor almost always can be reached, unless of course he, and I say he, because I don't think a she would do this, goes on the Appalachian Trail for six days without a cell phone or any means of, um, <laughs> of access, but it's unlikely. And frankly, the governor could do that in the Adirondack Mountains also and still be in the state. So in any event, um, this provision, which really dates back to the days of stagecoaches and Pony Express, um, we feel should be repealed. And the governor should be able to continue as governor, even if he or she leaves the state for a short period of time, usually on official business. Um, in fact, that provision in other states, and other states have it, has led to some mischief. Um, in Idaho, just a couple of years ago, the and the governor and lieutenant governor were the same party. The governor left the state. The lieutenant governor decided to revoke all of the governor's mask mandates during the um, pandemic, particularly as it applied to children in schools. And then the governor came back and he reinstated the mandate. But um, even governors of the same, or lieutenant governor and governor of the same party can run into problems. And we just think that the leaving the state provision is really anachronistic. Um, getting back to our original mandate, <clears throat> succession uh, and dealing with the vacancy issue, we concluded as follows. And I gather that this is somewhat controversial based on what Governor Patterson said and what I anticipate Patrick Woods is going to say, but I'll tell you what we provided and we decided. Um, we decided first that it is very important to have a Lieutenant Governor, that having the um, having the legislative leaders as successors raise problems. For example, um, the pres having the president pro tem as the next in line and the person who would serve as lieutenant governor means that that person serves in two capacities, both as a legislator and as a lieutenant governor or an executive. Um, so we strongly, and the same thing would happen if the president pro tem didn't serve and the speaker of the assembly who's next in line served. So we recommended that it be made clear that should either of those people succeed to the lieutenant governorship or even governorship, but as could happen, um, that person be stripped at least temporarily of any legislative powers. So the person could not, for example, vote as a legislator and then vote to break the tie, would give the person two votes. So we felt very strongly about that and we would wanna change that. Um, we also, recommended, although we suggested keeping the succession of lieutenant governor position of being the president pro tem of the Senate and speaker of the assembly, suggested that if we then strip them of legislative powers and that meant that they declined to serve, which could very well happen, that the two potential following successors be the attorney general who is elected statewide and the controller. Now it's true that they could be of different parties from the governor and that could be a problem, but at least they had a statewide elective mandate. We also thought about a possibility of a further succession as in the US constitution 
and thought that the parties in the Senate and assembly should consider providing that the heads of agencies um, be possible successors as well. That happened when um, in 1951, when you all are way too young to remember this, but I do, when we were always concerned about a nuclear attack and there was a Defense Emergency Act and there was an act which was later repealed or uh, no longer in effect, saying that in the event of a nuclear attack in New York and that all of the people in line uh, already to be governor and lieutenant governor were, I guess, killed or uh, something, uh, various agency heads could become temporary governors, um, at least until the following election. In deciding how we thought we should proceed, we looked again to the 25th Amendment for guidance, although we did consider other plans and our, we recognize problems with the plans. And I think Patrick Woods will speak about some of them. Um, we proposed that once the governor finds that there is no lieutenant governor or that there's a vacancy in the position of lieutenant governor, he or she, the governor, be given 60 days to appoint a lieutenant governor. Then the legislature have 60 days to vet the candidate and that both houses vote for that candidate to be lieutenant governor and the lieutenant governor must be approved by a majority of both houses. That's ex pretty much exactly what the 25th Amendment provides um, for the vice presidency. Um, if either house rejects the candidate, we recommend that the governor be given 30 days to come up with another candidate. And again, the legislature be given 30 days to approve that candidate. If the legislature doesn't vote, the candidate then becomes the lieutenant governor. And if the governor doesn't do anything, then it's possible that the legislature could appoint as the legislature does with either the attorney general or controller when those positions become vacant. We are aware of a problem where the governor and legislature are at, at odds and it could happen. We had faith, but maybe not reality-based that the governor and legislature would work out, work it out and come up with a candidate suitable or viable for both. Um, Governor Patterson has just raised the specter that recently occurred uh, with the appointment of chief judge. It's a risk that we thought we could take as the federal government has done. We also then looked into the gubernatorial inability, you know, uh, and that's also part of the 25th Amendment um, for the president. That's a harder one. Well, it's easy if the governor declares him or herself or their self unable to perform, then it's clear the lieutenant governor steps in. But what happens? when the governor does not declare him, her, or self, their self unable or possessed of an inability to proceed. Using the 25th Amendment as a guide, we propose that if the governor does not appear able, but has not given up the job or does not think he or she 
is not able, that a majority of the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, the controller, and six designated heads of agencies, since we don't have a, the governor doesn't have a cabinet the way the president does, we suggested certain agency heads, including particularly mental health agency heads and health agency heads and labor heads um, as possible people in that group of people who by majority would declare the governor unable to continue as governor and the lieutenant governor to take that the governor's spot. If the governor disagrees with that decision, of course, and contests it, we then say that the legislature comes in and by two thirds majority of both houses has to make the decision as to whether the governor is unable to continue as governor. Unlike other states and the Law Revision Commission, we did not believe that the Court of Appeals should be involved or be the final arbiter of the governor's ability or inability. We felt that that was putting the court in a role that it should not be in, namely making findings of fact. The Court of Appeals in New York interprets law. It does not make findings of fact. And it also involves the court in what would become a political decision. And that was something we did not favor. Finally, the court might have to make rulings all along. And becoming the final arbiter would possibly prejudice the making of those rulings. So unlike other states, our court would not be involved. Um, that's the broad outline, and I'd be glad to answer questions when we get to it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Justice Friedman. Uh, before I move on, let me say some, some really nice words about Senator Warren Anderson. Uh, Senator Anderson, uh, at, when he was temporary president of the Senate, spent um, a year when Malcolm Wilson had succeeded to the, go to the governorship and spent uh, nearly two years after Al Del Bello uh, vacated the office of a lieutenant governor in 85 and 86. And when he was the temporary president, no governor really had to worry that 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 Mel, that Warren Anderson was going to take very strange actions when the governor left the state. So we can thank Warren Anderson for that. Um, and now we have uh, Patrick Woods, and I don't think anyone's uh, studied this and has written as 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 intelligently as Patrick has on 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 this issue. issue. Patrick. Thank you, Bennett. One of the benefits of Zoom is that it's difficult for you to see that I'm turning pink when Bennett says things like that. Um, let me start by sort of um, my first principle when I'm thinking about constitutional design and structure is that the constitutional provisions that uh, set up how government is supposed to function, what offices there are, and make sure that there are humans occupying those offices to do the jobs of those offices is that the me constitutional mechanisms should be designed in a way that do not require good faith conduct by political actors, do not require the adherence to traditional norms or the norms that were in place at the time the constitutional provision was added. They should, to the greatest extent possible, just provide for what happens next uh, to make sure that there's somebody in the job doing the job. Um, I, I preface with that because it's going to color sort of everything else I'm going to say to come, but I think it makes sense to start with the, with the easy one of the ones that uh, Justice Friedman mentioned, uh, which I saw Governor Patterson nodding to, which is the uh, provision that says that when the governor is out of the state, the lieutenant governor exercises the powers of the governor. 
I don't know anybody who thinks that that's a good idea these days. <laughs> I am not sure that that was even a good idea in 1777 when we added it to the state constitution because there were, among other things, British troops occupying parts of New York at the time. But certainly since the invention of the telegraph, it has not been necessary to have a provision like that. Um, we have been fortunate in New York not to uh, have had a situation where we had a rogue lieutenant governor, uh, but other states that have modeled off of us have had concerns that way. Um, and uh, it, is, it is to me that that should be the easy one, right? Getting that out of the state constitution um, I have yet to hear a principled argument for why it should remain. I have heard arguments that say, well, it's okay because you can interpret the out of state language to mean uh, effectively unable to do the job because they're out of state, meaning out of state and out of communication. I think that's a terrible way to read the language and you're better off just deleting it. Because uh, now you're just trying to save something through wacky interpretation or stretching interpretation to get it to be reasonable. Um, so to the more tricky stuff, um, uh, Justice Friedman is right that I disagree with a lot of the uh, suggestions uh, in the Bar Association Committee report, and I'll start with um, the succession provisions. Um, in my article, which I wrote 10 years ago, and my thinking has evolved slightly since then, but not too much, um, the, the version of succession that I endorse is one that is modeled loosely on a Alaska statute for their lieutenant governor. The way that that statute functions is that the upon coming into office, the new governor identifies from among, in Alaska, executive branch officials. In my proposal, someone among the uh, major elected officials in the state, meaning uh, the AG, the comptroller, and the majority leaders in the House and in, uh, sorry, in the Assembly and in the Senate. Um, at the beginning of the term identifies one of them as essentially the backup lieutenant governor. So that if there is a vacancy in the lieutenant governor's office, that person immediately and automatically becomes the lieutenant governor. Now, there are some concerns with that, um, but that avoids what to me is, is was the big problem in 2009 and is the, the big problem I see with advise and consent type models, which is that it avoids the possibility of there being a political gridlock that prevents the, the office from being filled, right? The office is automatically filled and the new governor is now designating another person from among the state's elected officials to step in so that there's never really the possibility of a break. Um, the, the Alaska version of this requires confirmation uh, of the governor's backup nominee. And that proved, I took that out of my proposal for the reason I just stated, and history uh, supported me on that because in 2009, when Sarah Palin was resigning as the Alaska governor, um, her designee also resigned uh, and the Alaska legislature was not in session to confirm the replacement appointment. So there was a vacancy created as a result of putting building that procedure in. Um, the reasons I don't like advice and consent, there's a, there's a whole lot of them. Um, and I don't necessarily have see a problem with advice and consent as a backup. As long as you have something that's going to put someone into the role of lieutenant governor immediately and unambiguously, at least in the meantime, right? Then advice and consent might be fine because at least there's somebody occupying the powers and exerting the powers of the office and ready to step forward if necessary. Um, but, my first issue is advise and consent doesn't actually solve the problem that I see Governor Patterson having faced in 2009. Because if you can't call the, if you can't get the Senate into session, right, you can't get the Senate into session to confirm a nominee. Um, and you can solve that as the as the bar association proposal tries to do by saying if the nominee is not acted on by the legislature in a certain period of time, then they're automatically confirmed. Uh, but that's not that much different than the current procedure for an unchecked nomination. Um, it, is, it is at least cutting the Senate out of the confirmation process as a practical matter in that scenario. Uh, I'm also skeptical uh, that, uh, I should say, I don't love the 25th Amendment of the US Constitution. 
um, mainly because I'm not confident that it really works that well. Um, the succession provisions in the US Constitution uh, have only been used twice. They were used twice, both of those times were within 10 years of the provisions nomination or suggestion and its ratification. Meaning it was the same human beings with the same norms and understandings of government that were, that were ratifying the amendment as we're applying the amendment, the only times it's been applied. I ask you this, imagine this hypothetical. Tomorrow, President Biden resigns or dies. Kamala Harris becomes president. Do we really think that uh, President Harris could get someone politically compatible with her confirmed by uh, the uh, confirmed by the House of Representatives? Do we think she could get anybody confirmed by the House of Representatives at all? I think I, I don't I don't like the odds, shall we say, of that. Um, and if we mirror that in New York, we have uh, the same problem potentially here anytime there's an opposition party to the governor in control of either the, uh, the assembly or the Senate. Um, and not to, not to get too mean about the Bar Association provision, but I also don't like the backup plan because I think it creates motivation on the part of the House and the Senate, if they are in opposition, um, to obstruct. Because eventually, right, either in the meantime, right, the temporary president of the Senate is, is the acting lieutenant governor. And at least in the view of Joe Bruno, who talked uh, openly about this at, at a symposium in 2008, um, they view the, the, that that gives the temporary president two votes. They get their vote and they get the casting vote. Uh, and Bruno was was expressed at the time that that was why nothing would move that would actually fix the lieutenant gubernatorial ambiguity because he liked that, right? He wanted that. So it seems to me that if you build an incentive in for an opposition party to continuously reject nominees, and uh, and if the governor gives up, right, then they get to pick which is what the Bar Association proposal basically is, right? then you're sort of inviting that kind of conduct from an aggressive opposition party. Um, I also don't love the timeline. Um, the, I, I understand the need to want to vet the candidate. Uh, I, I preferred uh, limiting the universe to the statewide elected officials because they've been vetted, right? That's already happened. In their, in their political campaigns, in their being elected to those positions. Um, because in 60 days, even if the governor acts really fast, like that's, a, that's actually a long time, right? The, the crisis in 2009 took 23 days from soup to nuts to resolve. Um, the nomination of uh, presiding Justice LaSalle took 55 days to resolve, both under 60 days. Um, and at least from my perspective, they felt like forever, right? Those were significant periods where people were not comfortable with the way government was operating. Um, and they're expensive. You know, the comptroller's office estimated that it cost the state uh, and state local governments $2.9 billion for the two, 2009 crisis. Um, you're sort of inviting that over and over again, potentially, those kinds of, of costs, um, if you're building in long times rather than having an automatic succession provision. Uh, that's in place. Um, one thing, and I, I'd love to hear others' view on this, um, that, it, that has always, it still puzzles me a little bit, because well, it seems to me that a lot of the structural problems with the way that we do it right now is that the person who succeeds to wield the power of the vice president, the vice, uh, sorry, lieutenant governor, um, is the temporary president of the Senate, is a legislator, right? And that's one of the problems that, um, Justice Friedman rightly identified, right? And it's where this casting vote issue comes in and something the Bar Association also addresses by saying no casting vote, right? Um, I, don't I don't fully understand why it is that you would want the acting to actually be the temporary president, as opposed to one of the other statewide elected officials that's in the executive branch, like the attorney general or the comptroller. Uh, and if you designate them as an acting, 
uh, then you don't have necessarily have the problem, which is admittedly a concern with my proposal, that one of those folks would not want the job because they would view it as a demotion from being controller or being attorney general. Uh, if they're acting and they can keep their other position, then that's not a problem. And it removes the incentive uh, from on the, the side of the legislature to delay, particularly if the person is compatible with the governor's politics, because now it's keep somebody who's already compatible with the governor's politics uh, or get what we can get who's maybe less awesome but more palatable to us. So I, I would really love to hear others' thoughts on, on any or all of that. Um, I, I can I see we don't have too much time left. I, I love also the Bar Association's composition of the panel for the presidential disability. Um, I, the, I'm, I won't get into it, but the, the proposal from the Foreign Rule of Law Clinic that's in the CLE materials, I think is, is a bit better because it involves all statewide elected officials on the panel and not uh, agency heads, some of, many of whom may be acting uh, and not having have been confirmed at the time that there's a crisis. Um, I'm also just not con not convinced that that provision works uh, because it seems to me that there was at least one time that the 25th Amendment's version of that provision should have been invoked in the past three years when it wasn't, which is when President Trump was hospitalized for three days with a novel disease that we knew had psychological effects, right? And if there's ever a moment that section four of the 25th amendment was designed for, it was that kind of moment, but there was no, like there was some talk generally about it, but no indication that anybody in the White House or the vice president's office took any steps in that regard. And so I'm not convinced that as a mechanism, it actually does what it's supposed to do in the real world. Do um, any any of the uh, Governor Patterson, uh, uh, you want to comment on uh, or question well, what's been said? Patrick, there's an old bromide that the more you plan, the less you have to react. And I think that it advises us here that what you're really saying is that the more that we focus on the activity that occurs after the plan, in other words, the plan tells us what to do even if there's a little disagreement here on what that actually should be, is far more preferable to putting the decision in the hands of individuals that might not reflect the governor's values and might not be acting in the best interests of the state. So I, I think it was a wonderful presentation and I'm uh, quite pleased with the result of that. Justice Friedman, do you have any comments on, on Patrick's uh... Uh, proposals or his, uh, his, um, his critique of the Bar Association. Well, I think he has raised some of serious issues that the Bar Association plan does have. Um, it, our approach was something like the perfect is the enemy of the good and that we wanted something that we thought could pass or had a better chance of passing partly because it was modeled after the 25th Amendment. Having said that, um, I think some of the issues that we did consider was the timing. And by requiring the governor to make that decision right when he or she assumes the role of governor, i.e. choosing a potential lieutenant governor should the lieutenant governor who's there not be there, um, means that you are requiring the governor to make that decision at a time when he or she has no idea or doesn't really know how things will play out and who would be the best person when the time, if the time comes. So we rejected that, although we did talk about it as being just too precipitous, if you will. Um, with respect to limiting it to a 
attorney general and controller, uh, that could really be a problem for a governor where you have most other people um, from particularly the opposite party, but you know, in a clash with the governor and putting them in, I think could be a problem also. The um, using the buffer of the elected attorney or the elected uh, members of the legislature probably would make it easier. Um, you just, attorney generals and controllers are statewide, but they are elected for very different reasons. Whereas I think the members of the legislature have much more in common with the goals and processes of the governor. So while they are, they have the virtue of being statewide, I'm not sure I would put them next. Uh, we have one question in the pipeline and it's from the wonderful Robert Ward, one of the most knowledgeable people about state government for over the last 30 years. And Bob asked when Senator Bruno spoke at the Rockefeller Institute during his tenure as majority leader in the, in, about the vacancy in the LG's office, he said he believed that in the case of a tie vote, he would have the power to cast both his own vote and a second vote in his role as acting LG. What do we think? Well, I, um, yeah, I, can, I can answer that one, <laughs> what I think, because I wrote a law review article on that 15 years ago. And the answer really is no, because of the wording of Article 3, Section 14 of the Constitution, which says that you need a majority of the legislature to pass a bill. And the casting vote basically applies to procedural issues and also gubernatorial appointments. But that's just, that's my version of it. I think, I think Senator Bruno was wrong, but I think he was doing that basically just to almost to try to, to uh, for political purposes to go at Governor Patterson. <laughs> I, I, I will say that that um, Rockefeller Institute is precisely the time, that's exactly what I was talking about when I was talking about when uh, Bruno made those comments. Um, and I, I think I, I agree with Bennett in terms of the constitutional analysis, but my my former litigator brain says, who has standing to challenge it if the temporary president doesn't agree and uses their casting vote to kill legislation particularly, or even to be the tie vote to pass legislation. Because um, to me, at least, constitutional provisions are just as good as they're actually defensible. Um, and I'm not sure that that one, I'm not sure how well, how many avenues there are in that scenario for litigation about it. I have a question. We we are, are oh, go ahead. Sorry, Governor. My question is, because I actually don't know the answer to this situation, I raised it earlier, that we never resolved in 2009 whether or not even the lieutenant governor had the opportunity to cast a vote, because my understanding was that the lieutenant governor did not, particularly on issues of legislation. That, that one place that the, the lieutenant governor could cast a vote would be um, in a leadership vote. Uh, I looked at it really historically, and the answer was that the, the lieutenant governor could only effectively break ties in procedural issues and exactly. nominations. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so when, 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 when uh, Senator Bruno was uh, a good friend of mine who once said to me, don't ever resign as governor because then I'll be governor and I'll be in more trouble than I'm in now. But mm -hmm. what... Uh, uh, Senator Bruno said when he came um, at, to the Rockefeller Institute, I think was wrong because he thought that he could cast the deciding vote plus his own vote um, in, in a legislative capacity. 
Um, our understanding was that the lieutenant governor only cast the deciding vote in a procedural issue on a procedural issue, which was um, what you all were saying before, and which disagrees with Senator Bruno, which wouldn't be the first time we disagreed with Senator Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> um, in any event, um, we still felt strongly that once the lieutenant, uh, the president of the Senate, president, temporary president of the Senate stepped into the lieutenant governor position, he or she stepped into an executive position and therefore could not, could not cast a vote as a member of the legislature. Right. And um, sh that should be made clear in the constitution. <laughs> One more point of history, which is that um, another uh, appointment that I made in 2009 was to the United States Senate. And that was after Hillary Clinton became secretary of state. Many people told me that I should appoint myself and get out of Albany before it collapsed on top of me. <laughs> and I um, was swayed in the direction. But the reason I didn't do it is that four Democratic senators met with me right after the 2008 election and told me that they were going to go over and sit with the Republicans. So this was even before the coup. They threatened to do this. And I persuaded them not to do it. And that if they had any issues that you know I could help them with, they could come to me. But when it came time to appoint the senator, I knew that the minute that I appointed myself, it would create an absolute uh, chaotic situation where they were now going to fight over who would be elected the present pro tem of the Senate, which at that point, um, because there was no lieutenant governor uh, a a after me, at that point would have created a fight over who was going to be the next governor, that it would be a political fight. And I thought that it would have been in Turnison and one of the worst situations to ever happen in New York state government. I want to thank everybody for, for, for this fascinating panel. And I want to thank our audience to stick with us well beyond the necessary time for CLE. Um, so thank everybody. Thank you all. Uh, again, terrific panel. And, uh, and again, vacancy is your CLE, uh, <laughs> CLE code. Again, uh, again, thanks to everybody involved here today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.